Delighted to have you here for our webinar today on ESOL literacy and oral language approach. And uh, Kathy Gardner from the Emergency Reception and Orientation Centre in Balahadreen with Galway and Roscommon ETB is facilitating today. So over to you, Kathy. Thanks, Fergus. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome or welcome back. I see some similar names to yesterday, some one or two faces maybe I recognise. It's very nice to see you again. Thank you for coming. Um, so my name is Kathy Gardner and I am an ESOL literacy tutor with the GRETV and I've been in ESOL for eight years and teaching ESOL literacy for three and a half. Um, and I work out of Iraq, which if anybody doesn't know, that's Emergency Reception Orientation Centre in Balahadreen. And that's where um, Syrian refugees who come to Ireland are housed when they first come to the country. And there's an education centre on site. Um, so we're very lucky there to have, um, you know, classes every day, uh, Monday to Friday from half nine to three. So we're a busy centre and we are very concerned with literacy. Um, so in the Iraq, we have um, 72 adults attending classes and their age from 18 to 75. And we have five classes and they do a literacy assessment and an ESOL assessment when they arrive and we class them by ability. And the lowest level students are in group one and two, and they are ESOL literacy students. So they are learning the alphabet in English for the first time. They might be learning to read and write for the first time. Maybe they are illiterate in their own language. Um, group three is ESOL with literacy support. So, you know, they can read, but they're not very fluent. Uh, course books and things, for example, might slow them down. So they still need a little bit of um, help with reading. And then group four and five are the highest groups and they're kind of like mainstream ESOL, um, your beginner, your elementary students. And um, the level tends not to be that high. Um, so, you know, for us, literacy is so important because 10% of our students are illiterate in their first language and 50% of them will not know their ABCs. So most of our intake are starting from scratch. So we work an awful lot with literacy. And what I'm talking about today, the oral language approach, that's what we use in groups one and two. So this is kind of what we've adopted and like we think it works. So, you know, um, hopefully you, you'll feel the same and you'll find it useful maybe to try some of these ideas with your students and your literacy learners. Um, so just to be crystal clear and, and define my terms and, and about what I mean, um, when I talk about ESOL literacy, I mean, of course, obviously we're teaching English language to non-native speakers. Um, we might also be teaching them how to read and write, maybe for the first time in their lives, um, maybe they're illiterate in their first language or they didn't have an opportunity to go to school. Um, or we might just be teaching them Roman alphabet literacy so they can read and write in another language and they're just transferring those skills to this new um, alphabet that we use in English. Um, so for me, it encompasses both those things because I would have both those types of learners in my class. What do I mean by oral language then? Again, just to be crystal clear, um, oral language, spoken language and listening and speaking skills. So in order to speak, we need to be able to listen and understand and vice versa. OK, so just laying that out there just to be absolutely clear about what I mean before we proceed. OK, um, so. What is the oral language approach? OK, well, you know, uh, I was teaching literacy and when I first started with ESOL literacy, it was really difficult um, until I started to find certain resources, certain books that I have here and um, that kind of gave me a little bit of a clue what what a better direction to take might be. And um, so the first one is making it real, which is teaching pre-literate adult refugee students. Um, this is a really practical book. So if you just want to get ideas about activities or, you know, how to plan your lesson or how to stage your lesson for pre-literate or, or beginning literate learners, that's a really good book. I highly recommend. Um, the next one, Practical Guide to Teaching ESL, ESL Literacy by Bow Valley College. Um, it has the theory of, you know, kind of what goes on in the brain when we learn to read, but it also has the practice. So if, if you're interested in the theory side of things, that's a good book to look at. 
And then the last one is actually um, a full course. It's available for free online at English My Way. Um, you do have to register your email, but you don't have to pay anything. And it has lesson plans. It has all kinds of materials and handouts and video, which is kind of a nice, um, a nice feature. And this course is based on the principles of oral language teaching. So if you use this course, you will be teaching in, in, in an oral language approach based way. OK, and um, so just those three things I would really recommend if you're interested in doing more reading about um, this particular approach. Um, so from these resources and from other research that I've done, I kind of distill this now just to simplify it and keep it as clear as possible into three principles. What is the oral language approach? There's three main things. Um, number one, oral language is a head of literacy, okay? So in the same way as we all learned our own language, English, we were listening and speaking before we were reading and writing, okay? As babies, as toddlers, we were listening and listening to our parents and families and caregivers for years and years, and then we started to speak. And we were speaking completely fluently and perfectly before we ever went to school, and then we learned to read and write, okay? So we're trying with our literacy learners to kind of imitate that or mimic that, um, because children who come to read, they already have loads of knowledge of the language, they have knowledge of the sounds, they have knowledge of the vocabulary, but our learners don't have this knowledge because they don't speak the language. So they can't read words that they don't understand, okay? So they need to be able to understand first and then they can read. So for example, you know, a native speaker uh, who is coming to read for the first time will, will sound out a word like cat and they'll go cat, cat, oh cat, oh yeah, cat, the thing with whiskers, it's furry, it has a tail and my neighbor has one and I don't really like him because he scratched me that one time. You know, they have a little aha moment in their brain and you know it reinforces the the literacy learning that happens um but an english language learner maybe will go cat cat what's a cat i don't know what that is i don't have that vocabulary so kind of nothing happens for them they have no light bulb moment they have no aha uh -huh, and, and and they don't reinforce or kind of learn anything when they do that and um, so we want them to pronounce and say and hear and recognize and understand words before they look at the reading and writing, because then they have more knowledge to help with acquiring reading and writing. OK, um, so the second point. We want to delay the introduction of the written form. So in order to focus on oral language, we just need to take the text away for a little while. So normally we'd go in maybe with a handout and we'd have the pictures of the vocabulary and the word underneath. But we don't want to do that now. We're, we would take the text away and we'll do it later. OK, so it doesn't mean that we're never going to do the written form. It doesn't mean we're not going to do any reading at all. It just means we might do it after loads of speaking and listening practice. We might do it in 20 minutes. We might do it in 30 minutes. We might do it in tomorrow's lesson. OK, so we separate writing from listening and speaking and do it later. The third thing we want to do then, we just want to diversify our teaching to include oral activities. So a lot of teaching can be sometimes very textbook based or very handout based, or very course book based. We want to make more of a focus on oral activities, speaking and listening. And we want to reduce text. OK, so. I mean, that's good for two reasons. You're getting more listening and speaking practice, you know, which is good for those skills for our learners. But also, you know, where there is lots of text, there is a lot of processing that learners have to do. And if the reading isn't very good, that is very stressful for them. OK, and um, so using less text, is just maybe helps our learners to process things more quickly, more easily. Um, and it's just a bit of a nicer learning environment for them when they're starting out to have less text to have to wade their way through. All right. So to summarize those again, we want to do oral language first, just like we naturally learn language ourselves. We learn to listen and speak first. We will do the written form. Number two, we will introduce it separately. OK, not at the same time as the listening and speaking. 
And number three, we're going to use oral language activities to practice listening and speaking skills. And these will be low text or no text to support learners. So um, I say low text, you know, some of my learners can cope with some text, just not a lot. OK, so I might have a couple of things, a couple of um, words or sentences in there, but not too much. OK, so. How do we do that then? We've looked at our three main ideas. How do we actually put that into practice? What do I do in the room every day? That's the most important thing. The first step. The first thing we do, we present orally. OK, um, so we use realia, we use objects, we use images or even video to teach new vocabulary or language. OK, so in my example here, here is my board and I have food pictures up there. There is no text, as you can see. I don't have the word coffee written anywhere. It's just the picture. And my focus is on meaning. Do my students understand what I'm showing them? And on pronunciation. OK, so I'm making sure that my students, for example, they tend to say cafe and not coffee. So I'm making sure they're pronouncing that word correctly and um, that they're saying eggs and not eggs. So sometimes they input an extra sound. And um, the reason that pronunciation is so important here, you know, when my student comes to read the word coffee, if they're pronouncing the word cafe, they're going to, you know, assume that the letter O has an ah sound or that double E has an eh sound and they're going to make all kinds of mistakes in their reading. Whereas if they can pronounce it properly, when they come to sounding it out, it's going to help them hugely. Um, we might need to limit the number of new words we do at any one time here, um, particularly if our learners are illiterate and they're not able to write anything down or record their learning in any way. So maybe between six to eight words could be good. Um, you might have discussion at this stage. For example, your students might spontaneously go, oh, I need coffee. I'm so tired. Or they might say, oh, I like, you know, I like eggs or I like something. And you might um, ask them questions like, you know, what what do you drink? What do you eat? Uh, what are some examples? What are some fruits? Give me some examples of some fruits. Um, which thing do you use to make an omelet or what do you use to make toast? You know, you might check that they can understand by asking questions. Um, what I love about this way of starting off a lesson is that all my students have the same start point. So if I go into the room with text straight away, my students who are weaker readers or my students who can't read at all are just immediately behind. They're immediately disadvantaged by that. But every single one of them, no matter their reading level, no matter their knowledge of the alphabet, no matter their education, they can all start at the listening and speaking level. So everybody gets to enjoy and feel success straight away. And, and, the, and it's kind of nice that the learners are all doing the same thing to begin with. Um, so that's the first stage. We present orally, no text. After that, um, we're going to do some listening and recognition. So we want to give the students another chance to hear the language, but without the pressure of having to respond verbally. So I'm not going straight from my vocabulary to saying, all right, Hassan, I want you to describe this for me. Or Fatima, give me 10 sentences there. I, you know, I'm not jumping straight to a production activity. I'm giving them another chance to hear, to comprehend, to practice their listening skills, but they don't have to speak just yet. And we do really simple activities here. So for example, we point to what we hear, or we hold up a card. Um, we can say the number that corresponds to a picture. For example, I say uh, juice, and they say number four. I say fruit, and they say number six. They can draw what they hear. Um, that's They're supposed to be bananas, in case that's not clear. They can draw it, hopefully better than I can. Um, they can perform an action or a mime. So, um, you know, this is good with verbs, for example, and um, with classroom instructions. Or they can move to a picture on the wall. So I can get my vocabulary, I can stick it all around the room, and I can say bread, and they're going to go to that picture, or juice, and they'll go to that picture. So they're not producing anything here. They're just demonstrating. They're pointing, they're drawing, they're miming, they're acting, they're moving. They're using their bodies and they're using their listening skills just. So again, it's more practice with listening 
and it's very low pressure and there's no text. Um, okay, so now we want to move on to more oral practice, more spoken practice. And there's lots of activities that you can do that don't involve much text. So for example, you could do an oral drill using picture cards like this. So maybe with these pictures, I'm practicing um, the structure I go. Like I go walking, I go driving, I go shopping, I go to mosque. And if it's available to your students, if they know the days of the week or maybe some other expressions of frequency, they could say, I go to mosque on Friday, for example, or I go shopping every week or I go walking every day. Um, and you'll notice, um, you know, you, you're going to maybe model the language first. So you're going to say the examples, drill and practice and check the pronunciation and check the meaning with them. And then the students will repeat it for themselves. OK, and they might personalize it or not. And um, you'll see in the pictures I have post-its. So that's kind of to show the number of words. So, for example, I go walking. There's three words there. Um, and maybe my students, when they come to the mosque picture, they might say, I go mosque. And then they'll look and they go, oh, no, wait, there's four post-its there. Oh, I'm missing a word. And they might hopefully correct themselves. They go, no, I go to mosque. OK, um, so it's just like a little visual aid for them to remember how many words are in there. It's kind of just a, a nice little thing to support them in correcting and, and noticing um, sentence structure and, and little grammar items, maybe like prepositions. OK. Um, another activity, visual substitution. So here, the uh, only word you can see is the word I, um, and we're saying I eat eggs, I eat fruit, I eat bread. Maybe we're talking about our breakfast. And the nice thing about this is that you can add new elements or learners can add new elements and they can customize it to talk about themselves and they can recycle language. Maybe, you know, some words that you studied last week or a verb that you did a couple of weeks ago and they might make it a little bit longer, maybe saying I eat bread and butter. So that would be a very simple kind of way to make that more complex. Um, or they might add verbs. So maybe now you're saying things like I eat Da, da, da. I drink, da, da, da. I like, da, da, da. or I don't like, or I love. Um, so, you know, they're kind of adding to it and making it more complex and personalizing it the whole time. And there's no text here. And it's the word order is really clearly reinforced. Um, another oral practice activity, uh, picture stories. So you might put a series of pictures that tell a certain story on the board. And you're introducing or practicing your sentence structures and um, maybe for low levels you will repeat the same structure and, and maybe just vary one word so um, he goes to the shop he buys milk he buys sugar he buys rice he buys bread he buys tea and um, so the repetition kind of helps them with the reading and remembering but you varied it enough that it, it's worth doing and then for higher levels, you could have multiple structures. You know, he goes to the supermarket, he writes a list, he needs milk, bread and eggs, etc. cetera. Um, so I would show the pictures, my approach, I would elicit the vocabulary. So I would ask, what's this? What's this? What's this? Who's this? Um, I would ask questions like, where, you know, where is he? Uh, what is she doing? Is he at work? No, he's not. He's shopping. And, um, you know, what what does he buy first? What does he buy second? All those kind of things. And then um, <clears throat> later, if you're introducing a written form based on a picture story. You can label the picture with words. Like we have the food words here. Or you could match the sentences if your learners are, are able for that, match the sentence to the picture. Um, this particular example comes from the ESOL Literacy Resource Pack by Lisa Carlson. Now, that's a, a resource that you do have to pay for, but some of you might have it in your centres already. Um, and it, it, it's good. It is worth getting. Now, I know the pictures here are very kind of old fashioned in, this, in the style, but the description of what to do and the steps to take when you're teaching pre-literate learners are, are very clear and, and um, I find them very helpful. But it's really easy to make your own picture story. So, for example, here's one I made about um, recycling and the bins. And um, so here your language might be, you know, I have three bins. I have a blue bin. I have a black 
brown bin, I have a black bin. I put paper and plastic in the blue bin. I put food in the brown bin. The bins go outside. A truck comes to my house. Um, you know, the brown bins go on Monday. The black bins go on Wednesday, etc. So, you know, it, it really is just images and you sort of sequence them in a way that tells a story or that, you know, gets a particular point across. Um, grids really nice one because you don't really need any materials for this other than pictures and you can just put it up on the whiteboard so here we're talking about our likes and dislikes for food and maybe the students have answered my questions or they have spoken about their likes and dislikes and maybe i have filled in the boxes um pre-covid probably i would have had students come up to the board and listen to their classmates and, and they would be the teacher and um, probably not so much now um, but the nice thing about this is you can just extend this activity in so many ways. So you can, the students can answer yes or no questions about what they see in the grid. For example, does Fatima like onions? Does Omar like coffee? And um, they can answer, you know, what, when, where, who questions like what does Dina like? Who doesn't like fish? They can say if something is true or false. Um, so if I say Fatima likes fish, they'll say no, teacher. Or uh, if I say, you know, uh, Dina likes pizza, they'll say yes. And again, these activities, you know, they're not speaking, but they are listening and they are um, paying attention to questions and they are demonstrating comprehension. Um, they can also make statements about the grid. So they can say Fatima likes tea or Omar doesn't like milk. They can match word cards to the pictures in the grid. Uh, you can make a closed sentence activity um, so they have to fill in the missing word and they could do this in their notebooks. Um, or they could put word cards in order to make sentences about what's on the grid. So there's just so many ways to extend and recycle this activity. Um, and, you know, the text is minimal to begin with, but we build it up and build it up and build it up. And that's very achievable. Um, information gap is another classic activity. It's a pair activity. And one person has information that the other person needs. So here, you know, the speaking practice is how much is, mm, how much is, mm, how much is, mm, and they're saying, practicing saying their prices. So this is a very simple example from English My Way. And, um, you know, there's not, a lot of prices that they had to have to ask for here, but you could easily um, add items yourself in, a, in, a, in your own version of this kind of handout. Um, board games for speaking are nice, really simple. You know, depending on the level your learners are at, it might just be that they say the word on the square, you know, um, and doing the board game, it's more just about changing the dynamic in the room, having people work in a group or, you know, it being a little bit silly or a little bit more fun. Um, if they're able for it, they can use a target structure. Um, for example, I like or I don't like garlic, for example. Um, you can see I have some squares that have letters on them to kind of get a little phonics focus in. Um, so they might name a food or more than one food that starts with the letter F or the letter P or the letter S or the, letter, the letters CH. Um, or they might name foods by their color. And um, so they can name yellow foods, green foods, uh, purple foods, red foods. So, you know, there's ways that you can customize it to make it more fun and to get a phonics focus as well as a speaking focus in there. Um, another oral activity with very low text. So this originally, this text, this handout had loads of text on it. All of the words were under the pictures, but I just deleted them all out. Um, and all I've left is, um, the question do you like at the top the students will tick yes or no in the box so they don't have to write anything and they're just using one target structure repeated many times to ask questions okay and um, at the end then they can get more speaking and listening practice they can report their findings to another student or to the class so you know they're going to tell a new partner about their old fat, uh, their old partner, and they'll be saying, "Okay, so you know, Fatima likes pizza, but she doesn't like fish. She doesn't like cheese, and um, you know, she loves chicken." Blah blah. Um, this particular example comes from 
SQA, ESOL Literacies, uh, which is the Scottish Qualifications Authority. Um, and they have a whole series of books for literacy level learners um, on the alphabet, on food, on hobbies, on, on all these different themes. And they're available at sqa.org.uk. It's, it's a nice series of books. Okay, the last one here, and then it's another type of survey, a post-it survey. So I can put a question on the wall on A3 paper to make it nice and big. And the students register their response by sticking post-its in the on the side of the page that shows their answer. So here we're talking about our morning routine. Um, do you make coffee? Do you look at your phone? And they're just saying yes or no. So it's really simple. And I have pictures to kind of support the reading, like a picture of the coffee, a picture of the phone. Um, and you can follow this with some class discussion or making statements like, um, you know, everybody looks at their phone in the morning. Um, most people make coffee. Or you could ask questions like, okay, who doesn't make coffee in the morning? Oh, what do you make? Um, or, you know, that, that kind of thing. Another version of this you could do with times, like what time do you eat? What time do you wake up? You know, what time do you go home, etc. And again, you can make similar generalizing statements or you can ask questions like, um, you know, who gets up at five o'clock? Why do you get up at five o'clock? What do you do? Um, you know, you can have some more discussion and that kind of thing. Um, all right. So after we've done all of that oral practice and our students have had lots of listening and speaking opportunities, then we can introduce um, the written form. But we'll, we'll do it thoughtfully, you know, depending on the level of our learners. So, for example, Maybe today I did some food words and we had the word sandwich and soup and sauce. And I might ask my students, OK, what, what's the, the first letter in, in all of those words? And they'll say, OK, it's S. And I'll be like, OK, we're going to look at the letter S today. You know, and maybe we'll do some handwriting practice. We'll elicit some other words that start with the letter S and, and we'll do a full phonics and, you know, 10 or 15 minutes on just this letter S. If they don't know it and um, some students who maybe know the alphabet a little bit better, maybe they're not great, they're not ready for reading full words yet, they could match <clears throat> their letter tiles to the pictures. So that might be their version of the written form for today. If my students can uh, decode and if they can sound out words more confidently, I might give them a matching task to do. And if my students are ready to read simple sentences, I could give them a little reader like Salem goes to the shops, he buys bread, he buys rice, he buys milk. OK, um, all right. So do we have any questions at this stage? Because just before we go into our task, I'd like to see, did, does anybody want to ask anything or share anything? Hi, this is Lorcan. Um, I Hi. teach ESO Literacy in Sligo. I just um, tried, I tried to register there in English my way just to let people know that they need a, a British postcode, I think, to register. Yeah, if you, if you email them, they're, they're really sound. I, so obviously I had the same issue. So if you don't have a British postcode, if you just email their help desk, they'll, they'll sort you out. Yeah. If you just, I, just, I just made up a British postcode that I know. Or yeah, you could make it up if you're, uh, if you're so inclined, if you have those kind of skills. That's not my skill set, unfortunately, but fair play to you, Lorcan. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, just to let people know that that's what you need. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Sorry, I'd forgotten about that, but they, they will sort you out. They're, they're a nice crowd. And uh, I see some questions here in the chat. How do you decide if a low level ESOL learner has a literacy issue in their own language? Um, well, yeah, that's kind of an interesting one. And I'm sure it varies greatly from centre to centre. In, in our centre, you know, we're very lucky to have a lot of interpreters on the site most of the time. And one of our staff members is a fluent Arabic speaker. Um, and also a few of us, maybe like three or four teachers have kind of learned some Arabic and we have learned the script. So what I would do, um, I would usually talk to them, first of all, about you know, did they go to school in their own country? How many years did they go to school? And kind of just get an idea of how much time they spent in education. That's usually a good indicator. Um, also, a simple thing that I would do is maybe I would just ask them to write their name in their own language. Sometimes they can't write their name in English. And I say, OK, can you write your name in Arabic? And if they say, 
no, I can't write my I can't write my name in Arabic. I'll know straight away that you know that there's a major literacy issue there. So either inquiring by the educational background, get them to write their name in Arabic, or if you have a staff member who knows a little bit of the script, you might be able to go through with them. What's this? What's this letter? What's this? And if they can tell you, oh, that's Aleph, that's Noon, that's Ka, that's Ra, you know, if you have someone who can do that. But um, yeah, normally inquiry into the kind of educational background is, is usually a good indicator. Um, you know, if they've had nine years of schooling, I mean, they're going to be able to read and write. If they've had, I find with Arabic, if they've had three years of schooling, they can sometimes be maybe semi-literate, you know, um, because Arabic has loads of rules for how you join up the letters and they mightn't have acquired all of the rules, but they could just be lacking confidence. But, you know, certainly if they tell you they never went to school or they only went for one or two years um, and it's 20 years ago, you could, you could find a literacy issue in the first language. Um, and Rosario says, is there a recommended max number of learners for the various levels? Well, you know, that's really a question for the centre managers, isn't it? They ultimately decide. Um, you know, we definitely, since we started working in Iraq, have pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed for changes. Um, and it's happened very slowly. And kind of because we've proven that the students progress better when they're in their own group, we've kind of managed to keep the class sizes fairly low. But, you know, with COVID at the moment there, you know, I have had classes with 27 students in them, like 27 men and women who didn't speak <laughs> any English and who some of them had the alphabet and some of them couldn't. So like that, that's just the reality of staffing and the centre. But, you know, from what I read, like you really want to have a small group eight learners, 10 learners, like you definitely want to keep it below 10, I think is optimal for very low level. Um, Rosario, I hope that's okay. Uh, I found that students who keep guessing, um, do, do, is that an answer to about there's a literacy issue? Gabrielle, I think maybe she's suggesting that students seem to just be guessing when they're reading and they're not really demonstrating decoding. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. Students can really mask it you know, particularly if they have good speaking skills, they can hide their lack of literacy for kind of a long time, you know, if, if they've got excellent, an excellent ear and they can just repeat things, you know. Um, but yeah, that, that's another reason to kind of test initially for that so that you make sure that that doesn't go unnoticed. Um, do you have mixed classes, men and women in the same classes? Um, I have had mixed classes when the numbers were larger. As it happened with COVID and then we went down to five, we were having some groups where it was like four men and one woman and one woman. And culturally then they really didn't like that. They either wanted it 50-50 or they just like didn't want to be the only woman or didn't want to be the only man. So um, at the moment, it's all actually gender segregated, which, um, you know, I'm not a fan of because actually they're fine when they're, they're, they're totally fine when they're in a room together. And I, I taught for years before COVID and they were mixed. And then the women would sit over here and the men would sit over there, but they'll be in the same room together. And I'm a woman and I'm their teacher. So like there is, there's, it wasn't really an issue, but yeah, that, that's just COVID. Um, do you make your own resources or download images? And I that thing ask. Um, yeah, I do both of those things. I, I do mostly make stuff um, Siobhan, there's a couple of resources I will use. I'll share them at the end. I have a really, I have a website with all of the links from today, and I'm going to share that at the end of the lecture. Um, guys, everybody was working on a different theme, so I might just go to each group and ask them for uh, maybe three activities that they came up with on their particular theme, okay, and just to describe them. Um, so we asked you to nominate a a speaker, a spokesperson for your group. Um, so I might come to group one first. So group one, their theme was the pharmacy. Pharmacy. And um, do we have someone from group one to describe the ideas that you guys came up with? Uh, we didn't get that far, Cathy, but I- Yeah, that far, okay. Because I have to go soon. I'm gonna just no speak if that's okay with everyone else in group Thank one. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, please. If anyone wants to jump in, feel free. Um we had the pharmacy theme. Mm -hmm. And um I suppose we talked a little bit about 
maybe what you do before you get to the pharmacy and symptoms. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things we said was doing the visual substitution. I have a headache, I have a tummy ache, I have a cough, I have a sore throat, you know, using the flashcards to give them the language. Um, we said about use it realia then as well to have our own little medicine kit mm -hmm. with our boxes of Panadol and our Calpol and our cough medicine and even plasters or yeah. things in it. Um, um, we said as well that numbers would be important in this. Mm -hmm. um, you could do a picture story. You know, maybe my son is sick. He has a fever and a sore throat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I go to the pharmacy to get medicine. Mm -hmm. um, we were saying to use maybe a clock with post-it notes on it to mm -hmm. show when to take the medication. Nice. Um, things like the container that you can get for the chemist with the days of the week on it for the different um, tablets to take on the different days. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of the information gap as well, um, maybe with the prices or the cost of the medicine that yeah. you could match the medicine with the symptom you know, a Panadol for a headache, mm -hmm. um, Calpol for the for the children or whatever, Lovely. Yeah. things like that. So, yeah, that's great. I, I mean, that's, that's okay. What more is there to think of other than that? That's excellent. That's like six or seven fantastic act activities. I love the idea of the medicine with the days of the week because you could give them a bunch of Tic Tacs and be like, all right, I take two tablets on Monday and they have to put them into the box. You know, I take three on Friday, you know, like uh, I like that. And it does reinforce the days of the week. So that's really nice recycling of language as well. Uh, good work, group one. Super, fantastic. Um, group two. The theme was daily routines. Can we have a speaker, a spokesperson from group two, tell us? Uh, this is Aileen. I've, Aileen. Been, I've been volunteered. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We're from, I'm from to represent group two, daily routines. Now, there was a bit of confusion between picture and sound and things getting lost. So anyway, okay. it was um, suggested a type of charades that you play a game, we play a game as kind of charades for the different daily routines, you know, and then let them, you know, what am I doing? Or, okay, some, some of it just as a guesswork, nice. a bit of fun as well. And um, then we thought we could incorporate buildings into that, right? As in the daily routine to go shopping, mm. go to the supermarket, okay, hospital, et cetera, if necessary, the doctor's surgery, pharmacy, and then maybe with the supermarket, that to compare a market and a supermarket, right? If people are from the Middle East, they're more familiar with them and they understand, from my experience, markets much better than supermarkets, right? That you'd get some kind of a reaction that way as well, as in a reflection of their own culture rather than our culture. Yeah. And um, okay, then we also thought, or suggested the daily routine, the times of the day. Okay, if people don't know the clock, right, the way we use it, um, it could be taught at that stage, although most people have a general idea, right? Mm -hmm. And okay, morning routines, afternoon routines, nighttime, does it change at weekends? Um, does the routine change? Is it different holiday times, different times of the year, etc.? Nice. And um, okay, as a, uh, where do we see? So we, we thought use, uh, to the use of picture stories um, could work for that, uh, as well as visual substitution, yeah. right? That you could put in, okay, for buildings and that for holidays or even the days of the week. Mm. And then finally, an information gap as well, kind of an information gap exercise. Information gap about what? What information would they? Well, be? I mean, it depends. What time do you get up? What time do you go to bed? Okay, what time do you have? What time do you eat? And again, you know, weekends. Is there a difference between weekends and um, the weekdays? That kind okay. of way. Yeah. Great, nice. So you're, you're talking there about uh, discussion activities, maybe comparing cultures as well, yeah. which is something yeah, which I think is absolutely nice. essential to yeah. self teaching. Great, thank yeah. you. Yeah. A reflection of the learner's culture. Lovely, lovely stuff. Great. And um, yeah, so the times, you know, if you have those little learner clocks, you know, yeah. they can yeah, be yeah. easily used in the visual substitution and you can 
you can just stick it up, you know, beside the picture and they might say like, I get up at five and, you know, that can be a listening activity. Maybe someone else has to come up and change the times on all the clocks for people who do things at different times. So yeah, lovely. Very nice. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Aideen. Loads of ideas, loads of ideas. Um, we'll go to group three now. Um, group three, you were talking about places. Yeah, and um, I, I'm going to represent um, group three. And um, first of all, we started with the discussion and there were lots of ideas, you know, um, mm -hmm. pooling ideas about the content or the type of language that we could explore in that. But we settled then on, um, so maybe five or six pieces of vocabulary for um, places in the town and the places that are of relevance to the students' lives, like maybe... Um, the bank, the post office, the school, um, the church or the mosque or the supermarket, whatever places of relevance are. So we're targeting very low, uh, low group here, sort of just the words and the vocabulary. And for teaching that, that we decided then that we would probably use visuals, pictures. Um, and you could use real, um, you know, pictures or cards or even something, um, a, a map of the town or a picture of the town and the types of buildings that are laid um, in, in the high street. Yeah. And then the second thing that we decided on that was um, uh, for a listening activity, you could have your pictures if you were in the classroom, we'd say your church and your, uh, your church and your bank and your post office. And then you would get the students um, to, OK, uh, Fatima, you go to the church, okay? Um, somebody else um, move, run to the to the to the school, and somebody else go to the supermarket. And then, as a kind, you could do a little bit of concept uh, checking. You could say, um, "Is this sort of show the church, and then and say, well, this is the school, and see if they've got it, you know?" And they could say, "No, no, no, that is that." And then the final thing, the board uh, a, a board game was suggested. Um, and with some ideas and things. So what can you do in the school? And for our students, a lot of the time, pick up times, you know, and dropping off for kids. So when they land on the school square, they might say, name the time you pick up your child or name the time you drop off your child. So they were the kind of ideas that we explored. And with, then we went into a little bit of what we might follow on with, with um, sort of um, directions and, and pl uh, prepositions of place. Where is the bank? It's opposite the, you know. Yeah. That's okay. nice. Yeah, like the, the functional language of where is the something, uh, lots of lots of uses there for yeah. um, for learners. And, and you had lots of listening and recognition activities yeah. that you were yeah. doing yeah. when they were moving to the different things as well. That was nice. Um, a nice thing to do, you were talking about maps, you know, like if you have a projector or a screen, um, sometimes you can project, you know, Google Maps has a street view and you can see the road as though you're walking down it. And, and sometimes it's nice to explore your local town that way and, you know, point the camera to the different shops and, and you could use that as a tool. I've used that before and that's nice for directions as well. So I can then say, where is the bank? And they'll say, OK, go straight and we'll use the maps. We'll go straight down the road and then they'll tell me go left or go right or whatever. And um, just because you mentioned maps there, Mary. Um, lovely. OK, final group. Final group was group four, and the theme was school or classroom items or, or that kind of thing. Do we have? Ah, uh, yes, Lorcan here. Lorcan, okay. Yeah, uh, so a couple of ideas. Uh, so someone said to get fit them physically active, so just to stand up and just go to the wall or touch the, the chair or just that's, that's a very basic level. Yeah. Um, then you could also just, uh, if you have some literacy, Write some, uh, write the words on flashcards and get them to stick to the, stick them to the, the correct thing. Mm -hmm. so you're in the classroom, so you have all the realia already, you hope. Yep. Um, there was also role play in a shop, so buying stuff. And I, I've also done with, uh, in, a, in a classroom, uh, just to practice the, the questions, do you have and can you lend me? Because they were always forgetting their pencils or, <laughs> chargers or, or erasers. So it was constantly, can you lend me? Can you lend me? So we did a lot of, uh, work with that before um i think there was there was lots of stuff but that was there yeah. were the main great yeah. good yeah so you've got prices in there you know like the, there's your information gap again you've got oral drills where you're going can you lend me a pencil can you lend me a rubber can you lend me a notebook and lots of listening and recognition where the students are moving to the object or they're giving the object to their partner who has requested it and everything okay great right. well, one second. Uh, we have a, a campaign uh, to improve tutors' conditions and pay. So if anyone's interested, uh, I put a link in the chat. Okay. Just to let you know. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Lorcan. Thanks very much. Um, okay. 
briefly, just before we finish then, so I, I, I said earlier about some uh, resources or even with one group we were talking about, if we had, you know, more access to resources, maybe they're hard to get for ESOL literacy. Um, I'm going to share my screen here again. I'd like to show you two things. Um, so the first one is a website or a tool, a slightly technology tool. It's called ThingLink. I don't know if you can see that up the top here, ThingLink. You might know ThingLink. Um, you can basically make an interactive screen, which um, has some benefits for literacy, as you can see, because it's very visual. So this is a map of Balahadrine. Um, I took a picture of Balahadrine from Google Maps, and I put all these little tags about different places into the map. So the students would click on it and it says, what's this? And they have to go, oh, yes, that's the hotel. OK, which one of these words is hotel? Um, you know, and it, it takes them on a little tour of the town. Um, we also might have a, a different question for a higher level, like, oh, what can you buy here? And it's the pharmacy. So we're buying medicine, for example, in the pharmacy, our local pharmacy. Um, over here, we have the supermarket. Um, and I put in a link to take us to another page. And I want to know about opening times and uh, what time does it open? What time does it close? Is it open every day? So the student has to gather tasks about, has to gather, the student's task, sorry, is to gather information about opening and closing times for local shops. So they click this link, it takes them out to the Super Value website and they reject all the cookies. And then it will show us, for example, we pick our county as Roscommon and we live in Balahadrine. So that's gonna come up here. And now they can see every day that it's open and what time it closes and, and you know, they can complete the task from an outside website. Um, if you're thinking, okay, well, my students are gonna have a lot of trouble reading that. There's a lovely tool here. It's called the Immersive Reader, this little book uh, with a symbol over here. And if I click that, it takes me to the text. I can play. What time does it open? What time does it close? Is it open every day? Yeah, so my students can listen to that if they need extra help. They can also click on a particular word and go, oh, what's that one again? I never know how to pronounce that one. Does. Ah, oh, that's the word does, okay. So they can pick up individual words and they can also, for example, there's a little picture underneath sometimes. So the word open, what does it mean? Here's the picture dictionary to tell me. So that's a nice little website. Um, for kind of having an interactive picture, you know, and you could have a picture of like a family and you just have them labeled father, mother, son, daughter. Um, the other thing I want to show you is here is a website that I made where I put all of today's uh, resources that I mentioned. And um, I also had another workshop yesterday on resources and materials and everything I mentioned there is here as well. So, um, if you're looking for a kind of a one-stop shop, this could be really helpful. And Fergus is going to share this link with everybody, um, either today or tomorrow. Um, so um, what I have here are some, if you're at the very low end of kind of teaching people alphabet, I have an alphabet workbook and some different, you know, letter tiles, wall chart, pictures, flashcards, upper lowercase, CVC words, activities for, for very basic learners. These are things I made myself that I'm sharing. And if you come over here to links, under the links, I have linked every website that I think is useful or decent or that I use. So there's English My Way, but there's some other things, uh, new to ESOL, Scottish Collocations, English, hands on. There's lots of stuff here. Uh, some YouTube videos and then some tools. Again, there's the thing link that I mentioned before and uh, a book creator, which is a software for making your own readers. Um, if you want to make picture stories or picture stories with text. Um, so we're gonna send that out to you. So you, you'll have access to all of that. And hopefully it'll, it can be like a little hub um, to make it a little bit easier to just sort of access things that are useful for this level. And, and, and we can add more to it as we go. Um, so in the, the, the chat here, um, any tool to impose an Irish accent on that? I don't know. Do you know that's actually an interesting one? There is one, um, Kathy. I forgot the name, but um, Emer Gil Martin, who worked for Sparassi and a number of organizations in Dublin, set up um, 
listen here or something, was it? No. Yeah, something like listen here, yeah. Yeah. Um, I can look for some of your emails. <laughs> yes. Um, I just can't remember. I think it's called Listen Here. So, and she's used the voices of Irish people reading out little bits of stories or not even stories, just little pieces from their lives. So there was a, we had a webinar last Friday from a guy called Angus O'Reardon, who's mm-hmm. Brassy, and he showed it. So I could look back at his presentation and email out then the name of that website. Yeah. I think it is called Listen Here. I don't think there's an option to change the accent in that particular thing, unfortunately. Yeah. But I mean, even if they were just using it for um, mm. to check to check the meaning or to, to listen to any kind of English accent, because I mean, you have those accents on TV and on radio and stuff. I don't think it's going to superimpose over the amount of Irishness they hear every day from their teachers and their neighbours and everybody else. Hopefully um, they'll have a nice gloss. Um, yeah, and that's all for me. If anyone has any other questions or anything, um, you know, I'm, I'm available. Fergus has my email if anybody w- wants to contact me or ask any anything else. I'm very And that's really helpful. It's great. Cool. Thank you, Paula. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, thanks a million. Paula uh, Kennedy has just um, typed in listenhere.ie. Yeah. There's a lot of Irish accents on that site, listenhere.ie. Thanks, Paula, great. for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it just leads me to say thanks so much for Kathy. Um, Kathy, that was fantastic again. So many ideas and resources. People are saying outstanding presentation. Loved your enthusiasm. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Kathy. That was great. Um, Thank you. People really appreciated it. And um, as I said earlier, Kathy's going to send me the presentation, and I'll send it out to all of you. Mm-hmm. And by next week, we should have this video um, edited and put up on the Nala Ireland YouTube channel. So. Thanks everyone for tuning in and contributing your questions and your ideas. And thanks so much for Kathy for so much preparation and a fantastic webinar. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Yeah. All the best. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. So there, Kathy, lots and lots of positive things coming in. Look at yeah, that. Yeah, I know. Kathy, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Okay, um, is it okay, Kathy? If I and thanks a million as well. Sorry, I didn't think yeah, you. Yeah, nice to meet you, Kathy. Really nice to meet you, Anne. Talk to you again soon. Have a nice day. Yeah. Thanks a million, thanks. Fergus. Bye bye. Thanks, thanks, thanks Fergus. Anne. See you. See you guys. Bye bye. Well done.